My name is Tammy Lee Meyer, and it's my honor and pleasure to share space with Dasa Ratharama, Harry Vandervelde, and Felicia Young. Uh, today we're going to be exploring growing systems of success and playing it forward with Felicia Young, who is an incredibly inspiring human that I'm looking forward to hearing more about. And Harry and I are here in support. Uh, so Rama, I'd love for you to just do a little overview as to what we're up to in the session. Okay, thank you, Tammy. So I'm just going to try and do the screen share. Are you seeing that, Tammy? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So I just took this picture from Felicia's uh, interview. Uh, I think that's the one that got uh, caught at Harry's eye. And really quickly, you know, my work, as you know, is based on the PhD project model. And I still have the, you know, a really quick introduction there, an organization that uh, tries to diversify corporate America by diversifying the faculty. But what really struck me was it seemed like a pretty universal model growing, you know, the systems of success, which we have framed in terms of connections, conversations, clarity, choice, uh, coordination, and competence. Uh, what has really sort of uh, come into focus right now is the playing it forward, uh, which used to be called paying it forward and is still called paying it forward in the PhD project. And the reason for the change is I'm really trying to take this more in the peer-to-peer -peer arena as opposed to the mentoring context of the PhD project. So most of the model applies, but one of the things we changed was to add a little L to the paying it forward. So, you know, that's uh, sort of a quick overview there. Uh, I also wanted to just share very briefly the, how I see, you know, Felicia's work fitting in with the GSS landscape. And uh, one of the things I'm seeing is, you know, you can see that I've put, from my perspective, I've put the arts as a, an important vehicle for playing it forward. Uh, this is also timely for me because, as you know, we are checking out working out loud. But work, to me, has a somewhat different feeling than play. Uh, and it seems like art would have some space, some place in the playing it forward idea. And when I saw Felicia's work, there was really something very engaging about the way she had integrated the arts and community engagement, which is, you know, growing your systems of success by being in networks is really the essence of GSS. So she really had the network piece going. And then I think the other thing is the, the timing, because when you're looking at systems of success, it's a long-term view of development and success. And it seems to me like the arts really provide a way to do that. You know, different members of the community can join in to whatever extent they want. You know, maybe somebody can join one of Felicia's workshops for a few days, be involved with them for a few months, years, whatever it is. So it just seems to lend itself for this long-term development of systems of success through which, you know, projects in the community can take shape. So I'm assuming that once Felicia, for example, came away from, you know, Madurai, I'm assuming that some relationships stayed in place, some projects happened, and so that's um, part of my curiosity. And did you have a Plectica map that you wanted to show us as well? Yeah, this is the Plectica map. This, um, oh. Yeah, we are in Plectica. Great. Um, it just doesn't look as familiar to me, I think, because it says... Snow. Yeah, maybe because I had it already, you know, full screen. So. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, so is there more that we want to look at on the map? That's it for now. You know, we can probably just come back to it for a few seconds at the end. Fantastic. Great. So if you want to de-share your screen, that'd be great. Okay. So I'd love to invite Felicia to do a bit of a download as to her work so we can ground in that. And I'm also aware that Harry had, was very moved by the work, and I'd love to hear from, from Harry as well. Um, but Felicia, uh, if you want to just share uh, just a bit of an overview to give people a sense of, of what you've been up to. Well, I think sometimes when I'm asked to explain this work, I often go back to what inspired me to begin with, which is going back really to um, you know, the mid-80s. The mid and I was studying art history at the sort of the height 
of the commercial art world. And I began to question what the purpose and meaning of art was and how it functioned in our society. So it seemed that most art in our culture here in New York City was participating in what was essentially a marketplace as a commodity. And I became a bit disillusioned with, is that all art can do? And started looking back at other cultures and other times where art had um, a much larger integrated into life, into spiritual life, daily life, um, even social impact. Um, art in the context of ritual, um, going back to the beginning of time. So there was this big gap. And I kept saying, well, if this is what art is in our culture, it's not something that I want to participate in, even though I was an art history student. So I needed to find something else and another way that I could be engaged in art within our own community and culture. And that's when I came across in um, 1986 in an African art history class was the art in Igbo land, Nigeria. I actually wrote my thesis about it, which is actually a true community art form. And let's say the community has been impacted by infant mortality and drought. Their response to this social calamity is to create Mbari which is a, a long-term communal art making process where part of the community goes into a kind of communal seclusion. They're supported by the rest of the community and they create a mud sculptural hut over maybe 10 years. And when the shaman decides that it has achieved its goals, it's opened up to the rest of the community. They have a celebration. It has to, um, qualify aesthetically and spiritually and then they walk away and they leave it to decay and I kept you know that was like the ultimate for me anti-commodity statement it was all about the process sort of like sand painting um, I even integrated sort of the work of Christo into what I was writing in terms of process and ephemeral art so I was definitely going that direction and the functionality of it and the whole idea that it was art with purpose. It was not artist in isolation, but art making done um, as a communal and collaborative process. So that Mbari was sort of the key. It had all the elements that I, that inspired me and that I wanted to try to find a way to have a similar kind of art form that could have the same meaning and purpose. So I set out with that as the initial sort of quest. And then the other key component was I was also had come across pageants um, that were even done during the French Revolution. I had studied in Paris, so I did like some original research on Jacques Louis David's pageants of the French Revolution. Many people know him as the painter of portraits of Napoleon, but on the other side, he was also engaged in street um, actions and processions of 200,000 people in Paris staging funerals of Voltaire. And, you know, so there were artists that I started looking at, not just their work that was generally recognized as painting or sculpture, but how they also engaged in these other sort of larger community street um, participatory um, creative forms. And then I went back to India. My mo I'm actually half Indian. I don't look it. My mother is from Calcutta and she's an Ang Anglo Indian, but of mixed descent going back to colonial days. She's not a white person. And um, in fact, I have family that um, are originally from Madurai and from back in during the 1700s to the early 1900s. So I go on this trip in 1989. I travel all over India with the idea that I want to document the pageant and festival form. So I went to Kumbh Mela in Allahabad. I documented Holi up in Rajasthan and I planned the amazing thing, this is all pre-internet. Imagine 1989, I go to the New York City Public Library 
and I start looking up Indian festivals and I come across the Chitrai festival, Wedding of Meenakshi. And for some reason in this dusty old book that came out, I, I don't know where it came from, but it, it was literally that moment. I looked at the book and I said, that's it. I'm going to Madurai. I'm going to live there for a month and I'm going to document this pageant. And the incredible thing is in 1989, my mother didn't even realize that our family came from Madurai. So for all she knew, she's from Calcutta. You know, she knew her father was somebody was somewhere from the south or near Sri Lanka, but she didn't really know any of the detail at the time. So I go to Madurai, I live there, I document this whole pageant for a month. And then I come back to New York and all these community gardens in my neighborhood of the Lower East Side are endangered with the development and they're about to be bulldozed. So that was when I decided, you know, I had just come back from India with all of this. So it's the fusion of the ideas that I had about and purpose of community art with Mbari. And then along now with all this fresh sort of research and the, this large scale drama played out over an entire city and neighboring villages that goes on for three weeks and how that engages so many people in the telling of the story. So that was when I said, okay, I'll do a pageant, a procession that will be eight hours long, not three weeks long, but eight hours in New York City is very long. And it would go to 47 of the community gardens. And that way, it's all pre-internet. The only way you could connect these sites to each other was you had to show up at gardens, you had to show up at church meetings, community centers. There was no like even cell phones people barely had answering machines. So the only way you could actually reach people was to show up physically at some meeting. And the only way you would know about a meeting, since we didn't have Facebook, is you had to walk up and down the streets, maybe see a flyer hanging up on a garden gate or a pole, show up at a community center and ask people what's going on. I mean, it was amazing how different the world was when I started this project. So within a matter of months, I mean, thousands of people got involved, like over 50 community groups, schools, community centers. I had over 50 community gardens and everybody understood immediately. Oh, you know, people are like, oh, this is fun. We want to do this. But they also understood how important it was because unless the city and the larger community beyond just the gardeners understood what the struggle was about, there was no way we were going to be able to preserve the gardens because the city would have just sold them off and it would have all been done quietly. So that was how I, by connect doing this procession that went eight hours long, engaging each of the sites to develop and tell their stories through poetry, music, dance, theater, sometimes just saying what their spaces were about creating costumes for months um, that represented the different characters. Um, and then going back to India, I wanted to integrate a storyline. So that's where I came up with the Gaia who represented the gardens and her marriage. She gets kidnapped by developers. And then like a butterfly flew off a six story building into a garden every year, bringing a message of hope that the community could save the gardens. And then all the kids in the neighborhood would dress up as butterfly children. And there was a battle every year on 4th Street between C and D. And the butterfly kids, who really had, had wings, there was a, it was like a scene out of Braveheart. And they'd throw bags of flour, look like clouds. And the developers would fall. They'd put wings on them, sort of convert them into good people. And then the procession would continue. And someone in the neighborhood, I had grow live butterflies from caterpillars every year. And then all the children would release them at the end of the day. So it was an incredible journey of eight hours visiting everything from Latino casita pocket gardens to larger spaces, community gardens, tucked on every block in the city. And each of these spaces had their own story that the community got to tell themselves and also bring attention to the fact that these spaces were endangered. 
we even went to sites that had been bulldozed and did memorials where we had photographs and people saying like mournful uh, songs about the lost gardens. So it was both an action to remember and also catapulted action to save the garden. And then it didn't just exist as a drama or an art or theatrical event because the New York Times from the very beginning started covering this, not as an artist event. It was in the Metro section. It was as a David and Goliath battle between the poor low income community gardeners versus the big real estate interests in New York. So they viewed it in an entirely different way. And the, the physicality of going garden to garden built what became the Garden Coalition. And then by the, you know, it became an annual thing. So this was sort of an ongoing project. By the time we got to 1994, the gardens were really coming under threat. And that was when I formed a sort of formal Lower East Side Garden Preservation Coalition. So you had the creative project that had been going on now for four years. Now we added this sort of more formal organizing coalition, grassroots coalition, with representatives of the gardeners who started attending city planning commission meetings, going and testifying at city hall. I mean, these were people who had never stepped into city hall or spoken up at community board meetings. But now that they had been engaged through the art and through the theatrical um, sort of platform of the pageant, this was now the next step to actually take that theatricality and bring it into the sort of more formal city council, you know, city planning process. And it, it was an incredible thing. I mean, we had people mapping the gardens. We had people doing letter writing at one. So out of that, we formed the Lower East Side Garden Preservation Coalition. We got some gardens saved. We lost some. Then in 1996, we had Mayor Giuliani, who went after all the community gardens in New York. And then it was over 800 gardens. And it was out of a New York Times article where I read that the plight that we had in our neighborhood was actually now magnified in neighborhoods across all the boroughs of New York. So I called information at that time. People actually had phone numbers that were listed back in the day. And I got the numbers of the people in the article and I called them up and I said, well, we've been organizing We've been doing this cultural pageant. We have a coalition. We should form a citywide coalition. So it was like overnight, we had Harlem, South Bronx, Upper West Side, Brooklyn. All of a sudden, we represented the entire city of New York. We had a meeting with over 200 people showing up on the Lower East Side of all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, economic backgrounds, people from so many different, different cultural um, pockets of the city who all had this common purpose. And that was became the New York City Garden Preservation Coalition, which then became its own thing a few years later. It's incorporated, it's an ongoing coalition today. And it was incredible overnight, all of a sudden you had the borough president paying attention. We even got Bette Midler involved. I mean, there was like four and a half million dollars raised to buy some gardens that are now in a, in a land trust. And then Bloomberg, who had his corporation, had been giving us some support for the pageant project. I actually got to meet with him at Bloomberg Corporation, and he was clicking around on my website, curious. This is several years before he ran for mayor. And he said, are we working with you? And I said, well, I hope so. I couldn't even, it was unbelievable. I didn't even realize that this guy would end up being mayor. So a few years later, he's mayor and day one as mayor, because of all the legal suits our coalition had brought, he transferred hundreds of gardens to the parks department where they remain in temporarily protected. So it didn't save all of them, but it certainly saved the majority and the majority on the Lower East Side. So all those gardens where I'm now doing this new pageant about climate resiliency wouldn't be there today 
had we not done that project. So that project went on from 91 to 2005. That was 15 years. And um, once the gardens were preserved, I sort of kept doing the pageant a few more years, but then I felt it had served its purpose. And it was 15 years. So that's when I began to think about, well, how can we take these methods and apply them to other issues? in the community. And that's when I look to the Hudson River and river restoration, then go back to India and brought the Vaigai River restoration project. And now doing the ecological city project, which is bringing together all the climate solutions that are being developed out of the gardens we preserved, as well as the waterfront. Amazing. Um, I just, in our checking, um, Harry had mentioned that when he, when he came in contact with your work, that he really felt it. I, I felt I was crying when you were talking. I've been here like you can't see it, but I, it's so moving to hear what you've been up to, and uh, I'm just really honored to meet you and to hear what it is that you've been doing and really learn about it. Um, and Harry's back on cam. Thank you. Um, and I'd also love to uh, weave in uh, Rama's work in terms of, you know, the growing systems of success. And part of that is looking at what really worked and in knowing a little bit about her system, you know, connections, clarity about what it is that uh, you needed the conversations that that you had um, and uh, everybody built their competencies uh, towards that and there's some more C's that I'm sure Rama can speak more to but uh, I just wanted to tie that piece of the work in as well well one of the C's too is coordination and it seems to me that the parent you know the parent approach is an interesting way to build that coordination to, to put you know just just seeing the pictures and the video you can see the amount of coordination it would take to put something like that together so one of the things that strikes me is you know just the immersive nature of the experience you just bring people together you know instead of talking at them about diversity or whatever it is you just do things together and do things that are fun and engaging so to me, you know, there's just a very natural fit between arts and playing it forward. So it just caught my eye that she'd made that connection between uh, art as a form of community engagement. And Harry, maybe you can speak a little bit to your experience in coming into contact with Felicia's work. I think it was yesterday or the day. Sorry, you were muted. Oh, I'm muted as always. Am I muted? You're not, you're open mic now. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I was very touched. I cried, cried the whole video, and I wondered why. And I, now I think I know because it kind of uh, revived my hope. I was in despair about what art can do in the world. And it's because it's all boxed in, in galleries and, and sold to the riches and so. And, uh, and it's just like... Uh, like, like a form of prostitution, like it's sold and it's a commodity and it, it's not what it originally is. And now you gave it back its life and its function in society in this in a very original form. And art is about creation and things being original, what they are, what they intend to be. And that all came together and it's uh, it fits exactly in everything I learned about uh, what people can do together and trying to find the form and uh, it kind of is complements all this, uh, let's see, industrial, patriarchal uh, ways of doing things and making strict. And this is irrational. I can't grasp it, but I sense it all over. It's just there and it's, it's, it's a story and it's a ritual and it's shamanistic and it's, it's something I cannot it's aesthetic and all those things that they are kind of multidimensional in a way and it and it's not just and it's all this, all this at the same time and in a way that it is touches child and any culture 
any any age so it's so immersive as, as you say and so integrated that i kind of think wow this is the way we should do it and it honors what it should be original by its own nature and it's so great if it can work in lower Manhattan, it should work anywhere because if the, anything to me, uh, the, the caricature of, of boxes and stone and, and, and dead spaces is that. So you brought it back to life and then I see those pictures and then within a second I see it. And I love it and I, I'm very grateful and honored to, yeah, to see this and I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you, you have evoked. Well, thank you. I'm so glad that the images and those slideshows, because it's always a challenge for people who weren't there experiencing it for themselves, how, you know, to communicate to somebody through documentation um, a sense of that experience. So, you know, I found the slideshows are easy to do, um, and I put them together and tried to tell, tell the story of, you know, what the process was. Um, you know, it's also been interesting to see sort of how, in one case, like on the Lower East Side, where I'm doing it sort of as a local, somebody from that community, um, and then going to India, where I have, you know, some familial connection, but essentially an outsider, um, and, and how those projects are different and, and can be done. And it was amazing, because the Madurai project you know, the other, the garden project was 15 years um, and got these incredible results. But people will always say, well, if you hadn't necessarily saved the gardens, would it mean that the project wasn't successful? And, you know, that's where I really think, well, we got the icing on the cake with the saving of the garden, but it, would not have been an unsuccessful project even if that ultimate goal had not been achieved because all those community connections that are made how many people's lives were personally changed so when you look at change it goes everything from the individual to the networks that were were made through the project connecting schools to community centers to individuals to residents people of different cultural backgrounds even within a neighborhood that didn't have communication that did through the pageant and then those connections that continue beyond the pageant or beyond what we organize into future activities within that community and now because we have perspective because this project you know it's like i've been doing this work well, in that, that particular project is now, I started it 27 years ago. So one of the key people involved in the new pageant is this guy, Max Katz, who's a gardener. And he looks like a man to me, he's 27 years old. And he said to me, you know, I got involved, I was a baby. I was like four years old. And I participated through my life and he said, I have pictures of you, which was me when I was in my mid twenties in his family album. And what an impact he said that made on his life. And he is now 27 year old sustainability leader in the neighborhood. He's the head of that garden. He's leading composting programs throughout the entire neighborhood. So, you know, that was amazing. And we had a meeting last week and at the end of the meeting, he went home and found the pictures of me and his family albums and sent them to me after the meeting. And, you know, it makes me feel old because he looks like a man. So, you know, the idea that he was a baby, practically three and four. So that's the incredible thing. And many of the people who were involved like going back all these years are now part of this new pageant. So, I mean, it's an incredible thing because I'm not even proposing to them an idea of what, or a method that I think maybe can work like I did back in the day, because these, all, these people all know that is what helped save their spaces in these community gardens. So, you know, they, I don't need to convince 
anybody. And so all those people now, when I have this new pageant, they're all back, they're on board, they're ready to go. Then when I went to India and met this Vasamalai, who uh, was the head of the Don Foundation in Madurai, and I brought the idea through this friend Shaker to him about doing the pageant, I wasn't bringing an idea from the West. I said, this is your own local culture. This is your own tradition. I took your ideas and I applied it back home in New York City to get these gardens saved and it worked. So he immediately got it because I wasn't proposing anything sort of outside of the realm of his own local Tamil culture within his city. So he immediately got it, said, yeah, let's do it. And then I got this professor, Gita Mehta, came on board um, who proposes social capital credits. And she integrated that into the project and she put $20,000 in. And then I flew back and forth to India five times doing sort of several week sessions to um, create the pageant. And, but that was amazing because that was in a very short period of time, like within a year and a half in five sessions of going to five different times to India that we were able to pull like all these segments of um, like an entire city together. The mayor of Madurai came on board. They, the city officially appointed a panel for the cleaning of the river that had not been appointed before. Um, even the governor of Tamil Nadu um, got on board. Um, then out of that, the Don Foundation established a permanent Vigai River Restoration Trust. Um, and many, many cleanups happened. So it was interesting to see, even though you could come as an outsider, you know, I, I, it wouldn't have worked had I not had the, the um, strong, like the Don Foundation that had all the, the connections and could kind of keep the project going. And, and then how you, could, you have to be flexible and adapt because in New York City, artists are used to thinking in terms of innovation and being creative. And then in Madurai, I was, I was looking at the traditional folk art forms. Um, so I was going to the villages and finding the, the sort of more tribal communities that were doing these in Alagurquail, who were doing uh, paper mache, um, for the festivals and other bamboo um, sort of sculptures. Uh, most of these art forms are, are, are part of their spiritual life, um, part of the temple, you know, festivals. But the artisans weren't used to sort of taking it out of the traditional iconography. And we had these meetings where I would explain, you know, the, and everybody immediately embraced it. So explain the idea of taking these forms, but adapting it to the problem that was affecting them on the river in terms of pollution and, and this drought stricken region in terms of climate change. And so, you know, there was just a lot of enthusiasm. And again, it was a very similar thing with, with artists and working with various schools and universities and community people, even people living along the river banks. Um, so many segments of the society. There were thousands of women who all participated making these um, pots that brought water from different water so sources throughout the city to carry on their heads, um, you know, integrating that mulapari, um, traditional agricultural ceremonies with sprouts. And even as Vasumalai said, a lot of people participate in these ceremonies, but they've lost connection to their meaning and their original uh, purpose, which was very much connected to agriculture and the river. Um, we even connected up with the uh, Sungudi uh, Sari, um, which is another um, sort of local folk tradition, but the traditional dyeing techniques use vegetable dyes. And in the past, 10 years, they moved to chemical dyes. And then as part of the process, they had to put the sari in the river to uh, sort of spiritually cleanse the fabric. And, um, but in, in doing that, they were now, because of chemical dyes, they were actually polluting the river in that process. So they weren't only making the fabric sacred, 
they were actually polluting. Um, so that was when I found the sort of original um, Sanghuti Sari Dyer, whose family for like the past 500 years has been still using the vegetable dyes. And so we engaged him in making these ceremonial shawls and then we honored uh, the people living along the riverbank to become river custodians um, to then in, you know, sort of educate their communities and their neighbors um, about not throwing plastic and trash into the river. There's no recycling in Madurai and, and there's just endless amounts of plastic everywhere. And, and there really had been no effort made um, in terms of the city, in terms of an educational program or even how to deal with all this mess. So um, anyway, it was a start and that project continued. And then because Gita Mehta is a professor at Columbia out of uh, urban studies and architecture, and we had this huge university through Gita that got involved, that was amazing because she then got the whole department to come with like, there were like 10 professors and 15 students that came to India to collaborate on design plans for the restoration of the river plan. So we had two times Columbia University bringing people there. Even the, the people and the architects and people who were involved in the project got invited to New York. So it was an incredible thing. All of a sudden I'm thinking like, it, it's only like two years later from having this crazy idea. And the guys from Madurai are walking with me on the High Line in Manhattan and staying at a hotel in Midtown. They'd never been outside of India. <laughs> so I don't know. It was one of those just amazing, amazing things. So that that project continues, but um. amazing. It's it really. I keep tearing up. Like every few minutes, I'm like, wow, because it's so resonant. As Harry was talking about, how it touches you everywhere. It's a it's full system. It's and the fact that you've been demonstrating it for 27 years, that probably every one of those 27 years were needed to be able to have the project in India only take two, right? Um, Rama, I would love to invite you to weave in some of your pieces as well. A uh, piece that really resonated with me when Felicia was telling the story of the, uh, you know, 27 year old, uh, you know, who's now the gardener, that's really, you know, playing it forward, paying it forward in action. And I think, you know, when I um, first connected with the PhD project, that's really where they were, you know, people intuitively, implicitly pay it forward. So I'm sure that when the PhD project started and they've been there for around 25 years and it's a comparable time span, uh, even if they don't explicitly tell anyone, you know, people who went through the PhD project program, I'm sure pay it forward in ways that they're not even aware of. So I think that when you get involved in a project like this, you may not consciously say, I'm going to pay this forward, but it's just touched you, it's changed your life, and you're probably going to be a little different and pay it forward anyway. So part of what I did was actually, I'm the sort of the wordsmith, if you will. So my relationship with the PhD project was to put some words on what they were already doing. So as I went through this process, they actually formalized more you know, explicitly the notion of paying it forward. Now they have a book called Paying It Forward. So I think when you move some things from the implicit to the explicit, now organizationally you can tap into it a little bit more systematically. So I think that's something that could happen with, you know, um, in, in this situation too, because I'm sure people are you know, playing it forward in an implicit way without being aware of it, but can we do it in a more strategic, you know, deliberate way? And so that's kind of how I feel like my GSS work can bring some value to different people working in different ways in the community, because uh, I see a lot of analogies, as I said, you know, analogous situation between the PhD project and this work, because things happen and that's where the amplification of the effect is, because the people who participated now take it to more people and take it to more people. So that's why I realized that paying it forward was sort of the critical piece of the whole thing. And uh, you know, now it's playing it forward. So A, it's I think the central thing that really magnifies the impact. And the second thing is if you do it more deliberately mind, in a mindful way, then can we 
extend the impacts. And I love how Felicia's work is just a demonstration of what it is that you've been ex exploring. And, and it is about, for me, making it, how do, we, how do we put it out there so that other people can pick up these tools and do, the, do it themselves in their own ways? Um, and, and yeah, in ways that make sense. Harry? Yes. <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, Rama just hit the nail on the head. She says it's all, it, come, it came natural. And, and, and as Felicia told, and but it's implicit. It was all implicit, and now when you wait, when she said you make it explicit, then you formalize it, and then you can be uh, deliberate about it, and strategic and purposeful. And then that's what it really becomes very powerful. Then you know what you're doing, why you're doing, and how you are doing it, and for what purpose. And then, yeah, then then you then it becomes extremely powerful. And I like the way that this. Positive behavior pays forward naturally, because that's what it does. It, it's magnifying. It's it's magic. It's great. I love it. Well, I think the the thing now that when I'm thinking about applying it in these different situations, um, you know, because you're working with whatever the local community is, the local resources, the local culture. You're not really, in, it's, the method is, is flexible and it also reflects what's ever there and the people make it what it is. So it's completely adaptable. I mean, if you were to do this in a community in Africa or addressing uh, a water crisis or whatever problem exists, you, know, you wouldn't be bringing artists from the outside, you would be working with what are the local traditions and the local culture. It's more the conducting and orchestrating of all of these elements that are there. So whenever that's, I guess the, the procession that I did to save the gardens sort of was the time where I laid the groundwork for what the method was. So that was 15 years. But then I'm now very easily able to take those methods and apply them even outside of my own community by plopping into Madurai or now going back to my community on a new phase of this initiative where the gardens we preserved out of Hurricane Sandy when the floods hit, they absorbed all the floodwaters and they got a $2 million federal grant that they didn't apply for out of the relief money to put in green infrastructure in those gardens that we have preserved. So they are putting in bioswales and water harvesting ponds and micro solar grids and pollen bee and pollinator gardens and composting and recycling and permeable sidewalks. And they're on the earth school in the neighborhood is an urban farm on the green roof there's an urban farm on the roof of the public school building that we're working with. There are bee farms also on the roof. This is all happening within the neighborhood and within those gardens that we preserved. So now there's this formal $2 million infrastructure. Had we not saved the gardens, we would not have these climate solutions and this urban model that's now underway. And at the same time, because of the flooding that impacted the waterfront in lower Manhattan, there's a whole redevelopment plan underway with a 20 foot high seawall berm um, being planned for the next 20 years around lower Manhattan, planting wetlands, putting oysters in the river to organically cleanse the river, gray water recycling infrastructure. So there's all this going on all within the neighborhood. So that's where I could see all of a sudden, like the next phase, okay, now the climate solutions are not just being imagined. Here we have them right here in our neighborhood, between the gardens, the neighborhood and the waterfront. And so this pageant, a six hour pageant connecting 20 sites, and we have over 50 community partners involved in this, all creating 
visuals and performances and ceremonies at each site. So each site is highlighting not just a sustainability climate theme that they pulled out of thin air, it's rooted in what is happening at that site. But many people walk up and down the streets and they don't see this green infrastructure because most of it is in the design phase. They just walk up down the sidewalk, they don't even know it's happening. So when people feel so overwhelmed with all the attacks that are happening on our environment, they don't realize that these solutions and are pushing forward right all around them. So that's what I'm hoping through the pageant is that the pageant itself is going to reaffirm and amplify all these solutions and make just not the few people who may be involved in those projects, but the larger community. And then even beyond that, I'm trying to impact the mayor's office of sustainability. So when Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, you had our mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo say, well, New York is upholding the Paris Climate Agreement. And we have certain, they have certain goals of reducing carbon emissions that they need to get to. Well, these gardens and these initiatives are part of reaching those sustainability goals, but yet the mayor nor the gov governor have acknowledged the importance and some of the gardens still can remain under threat that didn't get into parks. So it's a crazy at a time where you'll have these governors or mayors wanting to throw billions of dollars to create sustainability plans and projects. And at the same time, not acknowledge what they don't have to pay for because it already exists. So I'm hoping that through the project, we're not just impacting, you know, it's like what's happening locally, but within the city, within the state, and how those, that model is a model that impacts globally. So how can people help, support, participate, and contribute? Well, um, you know, through the website, earthcelebrations.com. I mean, people can um, become involved if they are near New York or want to support our efforts in, in any way. Um, you know, it's, it's always a struggle to make any of these projects happen relies mostly on volunteer support. I mean, some of, you know, I raise money to pay the artists and the teachers that run um, a vast amount of the workshops, but it's not some huge staff, it's me. I have a part-time person working with me and pay uh, artists honorariums for, for many of the workshops. And, and then, you know, for anybody who's interested or has a problem in their community, I mean, it would be great to figure out a way um, to be able to facilitate people in other communities being able to, to do this and sort of teach the method. I mean, I felt like by going to India that way and doing that project, they were able to see how they could apply their own methods for these new purposes and could continue without me. So, um, yeah, I'd be interested in finding ways to do that. And when's the next event? Um, the Ecological City Pageants on May 12th, and we're running workshops twice a week. We had a workshop scheduled tonight, which we had to reschedule because of the snowstorm, but every Wednesday night and Saturday afternoon. And then so many organizations, beyond our bi-weekly workshops where we're making puppets and costumes representing all of those solutions. We have like Lower East Side Girls Club is do, making a whole bunch of uh, solar renewable energy bike floats. We have another um, Earth School contingent where they're making all these headdresses and costumes and performance to honor their green roots. I have a theater director that I that is working on a collaboration with LES Ready and Goals, which are the organizations that are sort of leading the coastal resiliency work after Hurricane Sandy and emergency preparedness. So that's sort of like a hard thing for them 
to get people excited about disasters and disaster relief. But now that we're doing this project and we're trying to get to some of the people who are in the public housing, who were most impacted when the storms hit, um, to be involved in the creation of this performance, which will be like a, a five minute performance at one of the sites along the waterfront um, in the procession. Um, so there are many, many different collaborations with university settlements and other community center. And I'm working with them to have some of their youth collaborate with this dancer, Jody Sperling, who's kind of well known. I mean, she's gone to Antarctica and danced on ice floats. And you know, we have amazing artists that you can access here in New York, but most communities can find creative people and have their own local culture. And so she's gonna work with the youth creating a, a dance piece about uh, water and water quality. So there's so many of these, you know, different sites where there's sort of deep collaboration going on through workshops and multi many, many sessions. So even beyond the, the sort of production and workshops that, that we run, many community people are saying, oh, well, we're running workshops in our school we're going to bring this into our science classes so that's the amazing thing is just to see how many different people um, find points of entry from college down to pre-k wonderful um i'd love to give rama a chance to wrap up but i just wanted to share that i have i have a, a good a, a really close friend and colleague her name is don morrison and she's the founder and chair of the working group on indigenous food sovereignty. And she's been doing this similar sort of thing that you've been in creating an event called the Wild Salmon Caravan, where uh, because salmon is, of course, the most important indigenous food here in what's known as British Columbia. And uh, and so they have this this uh, festival of, of creativity and, and spirituality where they go to all of the different indigenous communities and follow the path of the salmon um, every year and have uh, festivals in each community. And it really is uh, incredible how many people have come together and the power of knitting people together under the banner of art and spirituality and how that's informed. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, no, that's, I think I've heard of that actually. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely send you the links and, and connect you if you like. Uh, Rama, do you, wanna, do you wanna do a little, uh, uh, a little wrap up with us? Okay, so let me share the screen again for a minute. I think I went to the wrong place. No, it's all an experiment. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, the, something that I was thinking about in the last segment uh, is the difference between what I would call the, you know, in addition to the implicit playing it forward versus explicit. I think there's also what I would consider call the individual level playing it forward versus the organizational level. Uh, I think part of how the PhD project sees my work is yes, a lot of people have you know individually gone and done their own thing, you know where they've somehow taken the PhD project's work forward. But by really making it explicit, you know, designing the canvas, breaking it down, and I've been very specific about this is how you can replicate it. So I think this is really moving it into more organizational level, playing it forward, which can be more powerful. And I think that's what I heard Felicia talk about you know, maybe helping schools or maybe helping other community organizations replicate the model. So I think what I see there is maybe there's also a need for more, you know, resources because I've been in this content development sort of mode for the last 10 years. And uh, it takes a lot of time to take something that's, you know, implicitly and organically grown for a number of years and now try to spell it out in a way that other people can replicate it. So 
um, I, I think that's um, an opportunity and probably a challenge as well. So again, it comes back to playing it forward. And I think there are several different, you know, interesting issues here in terms of art and playing it forward and art and community engagement and uh, how we grow our success and also the orchestration. Uh, because I think the art provides an opportunity to orchestrate in a pretty engaging way. So just a quick wrap up with the uh, canvas elements. Okay. That's fantastic. So maybe we can just do a final wrap up round. Um, I loved this segment. It was such an honor to meet you, Felicia, and to explore your work, especially through the lens of, of Rama's work. I love what it is to bring our stuff together and, and to see ourselves in our relationships and reflections, as my friend Don Morrison would talk about. Um, and, and that this is a powerful movement that is all over the world and the ways that we express it uh, are really beautiful to see. So I was very, very grateful and moved to be able to participate today. So thank you. Harry, do you wanna share any, any final thoughts? No, I was very happy to, to witness the conversation. And uh, as soon as I found out, I shared it on Facebook that I found Felicia Young in her work and it immediately got picked up by the people I hope who would react so people in Antwerp I know are kind of trying to do community activation and all that they immediately saw the value and and, and picked up on it so I think it's a very powerful very powerful and, and, and universal culturally universal method uh, which it has become from implicit to explicit as Rama says so I think that's very valuable but once the pattern is seen people recognize it because it's so universal so I'm I'm very happy with it thank you I'm very happy to be here Felicia? Well, you know, it's so, it really, I mean, it's an honor for me to have people interested in this work. Um, you know, it's different when you have people who are directly inter interested because they participate, because of saving their gardens, because they have a vested interest in the outcome. Um, and then having people who are viewing it through a different lens to really, you know, which isn't really the lens that, you know, most of the participants see it, um, you know, which is looking at it in terms of its, its replicable methods, um, the strategies, um, you know, I was experimenting with ideas and I felt by doing the garden pageant for those 15 years that I proved this strategy. And even though I proved the strategy and then replicated it again and again a few times, um, getting results along the way that, you know, still you can feel like I can tell you a lot of, I mean, the art world people and even a lot of the so-called community um, engaged art people within New York are still very elitist. And sometimes in some of the grants that I applied for, I didn't get, um, I got some, but I didn't get some. And, you know, that there are even divisions of non-acceptance of forms where they're still looking at this work, even though there's a lot of interest in socially engaged arts, they're often looking at it as sort of anthropological field work that has to go out and then you come back to the art world with whatever documentation you've done out in the field and then you bring it into the museum. And I just, you know, I rejected all of that. I never thought about how to cram my form in any stage of the game back into the art world. I just turned my back on that and I created an art form that addressed where I needed to go with this. And so there's definitely a division, so it's, it's really heartening for me to have affirmation from people in different fields to see um, the value. And I think that's more important than the acknowledgement from the art world. <laughs> yes, I, I love this is, this is living art. 
and not the emperor clothes as I'm used to in the, uh, in the in the galleries and all that. So you leave them naked and you do the real stuff in the real world. I love it, honestly. Rama? Uh, thank you very much, Felicia, for uh, joining us today. You know, I've, it's also been a milestone for me because I was uh, telling Tammy that uh, I'd like to explore this option of take somebody who's doing some valuable work and see if I can add my two cents to that exploration using the GSS tools. So, you know, thanks for the opportunity. This is the first one where we've really taken that live in a conversation. So I appreciate that opportunity. And, you know, as uh, Harry and Tammy have said, we really appreciate your work. I think you're doing something groundbreaking and I hope you can take it forward to a lot of people. Thank you. Well, I hope we can, you know, continue to communicate and, and share. Um, and, you know, open to opportunities. Um, I know there was, a, was it Michael or um, yeah. somebody else? Yeah, who, you know, was talking to me about in Igbo of all places, which is where my initial inspiration came from, was from Igbo Bari, um in Africa. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I look forward to, I guess, being able to share share these ideas and maybe there are ways to, to grow um, projects. Um, I think you do not have to worry. Uh, as Picasso said, grow, great artists, they steal. So your work will be st stolen all over the planet. Don't worry. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your time and energy and attention. And thanks also to all those who have built on this work and for all of those who will take this work to its next places. Thank you. Thanks.